Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Alice, and I am the Director of Community and Events at the New York Technology Council. We are a nonprofit that fosters, that supports the tech, system, tech ecosystem in New York City. Um, we offer over 30 panel discussions and special events throughout the year, all focused on helping you build your tech company. We are sponsored by some of the best organizations in the world, um, and it may sound trite, but we would not be here without their support. Um, I'd like to thank MongoDB for hosting tonight's event. Um, the company recently closed $150 million in funding and is now the highest valued startup in New York City. Uh, tonight, their CTO will talk about the MongoDB database and describe how it is designed for agility and scalability. Elliot? Hello. So uh, I'm Elliot Harwitz, I'm the CTO of MongoDB. And there were some questions earlier, but this is our headquarters. We are a New York-based database company, which is definitely rare, but generally a very good thing. Not sure. Um, so tonight we'll talk about a few different things. So mostly we'll talk about a little bit what you know I generally think about a lot, what you know we're doing a little bit differently about building you know both MongoDB the database, how we're thinking about what to do over the next few years how we sort of built the company a little bit, um, and a lot about what I spend my time worrying about and how we sort of solve those problems. And the way, and how, how many people here know about MongoDB at all? How many people don't know anything about MongoDB? No one, all right. So we're not gonna do it, we'll, we'll skip the re repetitive intro. So, great, yep, that's it. So the way we're gonna break this down is into three different sections, right? Three different things that I spend my time worrying about. So three masters I serve, and there's probably a lot more than three. My wife would, would be a fourth, my assistant would be a fifth, who's hiding in the corner, and there's probably about seven or eight more. But there's really three big ones. So the first one, um, well, the three, we'll go through them. So innovation, maturity, and management, right? So sort of this is how I spend my time. So the first thing is really all about, you know, are we building the right thing? What is the right kind of thing to build? We have to build new product, come up with new product ideas, come up with new features, figure out all those sorts of things, make it work well, and how that all happens. Maturity, we've got to make, you know, databases are a little bit unique in that they are sort of the cornerstone of an infrastructure. But if you compare a operating system to a database, if your database runs on Linux or runs on Solaris, you don't really care too much as long as it works. But the database, moving databases is hard, so databases have to be incredibly reliable, incredibly robust, incredibly scalable, and all sorts of things. So you sort of got to make those decisions pretty early and always be improving. And then management, right? MongoDB is now about 330 people worldwide, about 170, 180 in New York City. And 200 of those people are, or 200 plus are technical, and there's 100 plus sort of engineers. So it's a relatively you know, decent sized engineering organization. You know, not huge, but definitely not small anymore. It's not a startup, it's not a tiny little engineering company. Uh, anytime you've got 100 engineers working on sort of the same product, it becomes a complicated management process. And it definitely is in the phase where it's not just a single tier, right? I'm not managing 100 people directly. Sometimes it feels like it, but there are lots of people and I have to sort of make that all work. So, Let's start, and if you have questions, please just bug me and ask questions. It's more fun if it's interactive. So ask questions and we'll have a lot of fun. Any questions before we get started? Is the pizza good? Just a quick uh, newbie question is, uh, what's uh, the status of MongoDB in terms of uh, whether you own the standard or, or you just provide one implementation of it? So the question is a little bit like, is there a MongoDB standard? Are we own it? There is only MongoDB. We own the standard, we own the copyright, we own everything. Um, you know, it's open source so people can go and play with it, but we, we own all of it. From a, there is no governing body or anything. It is just us. Which is why innovation and maturity actually are weigh so much on me, because it ends up leaning mostly on me and my team to figure out what to build and what to add and what not to add. So to start uh, on innovation, Right, so the key on in innovation is we're building a document database. And document databases are a whole new concept. Right, you've got object databases that were in the 90s that have some similarities, but a lot of differences also. And document databases generally are pretty new. 
there really there's a few other little document databases out there, but Mongo is, is definitely the largest document database in existence today or ever as far as I know for sure. And so the real question is, is this the right thing to build? What do people really want out of a document database? So you know, when we started MongoDB, we were like, oh, we're gonna build this document database and, and it's gonna be awesome because we really designed this thing to be what we wanted from, our, from a database. You know, the design goals really were largely set focused around you know, all the times we've suffered with databases in the past, what, what would we have wanted to build with? And that's what we built. And we built that, and then the question is, does anyone want to use it? Right? Then, great, we built this thing, is anyone in the world actually going to download this thing and run it? And if they actually run it, are they going to like it? And if they like it, are they going to have it in production? And if they, if they put it in production, are they actually going to use it for mission critical things and actually care about what goes into it? Right? That's sort of step number one, is we've got to figure that out. Were you building it in service of a particular business application or use case? Right, so the question is, were we building it for a specific use case? So actually, from day one, yes. By day around 30, no. Right. We actually started building it for an application. Very quickly, we decided the application was boring, we threw it away, right. um, and just focused on the database. But it was very much built from what we wanted from all of our previous applications, right? It came directly from those things. And so the first, you know, four years of the company's life cycle, maybe four, maybe even five, were really more about getting enough of a product that people would actually use it, try it, put it in production, and see if it works. See if they actually like it enough to use it, and see if anyone cares, right? Because the worst thing you could do is spend 10 years building the perfect document database and have no one care at all. And we really didn't want to do that because that would be a waste of time, and I value my time pretty highly. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about what the right thing to build was. We built it and we tried to get people to use it to see if it was a good idea. Uh, so we did that, people seemed to like it a lot, lots of people use it, but the, the, the truth is, it's still very early in the document database space. Right? The APIs you use to talk to a database are still, are still very new, all these concepts are pretty new. So there's still a lot of work to do. So a few examples. Uh, so the query language in Mongo is very simple, and you can't do some very basic things right now. So so the, the two examples of things you cannot do today that you should be able to do are one is a query that's, how many people here are familiar here with JSON and the Mongo query language? So half, all right. So quick aside, right, the Mongo query language is JSON based and you express queries in JSON and it's sort of like a match thing. So if you want to find a document where, a, where you find all documents where A equals five, you'd have a JSON document where you just had A colon five. Um, you can do other sorts of queries and greater than and less than and all sorts of things. But you can't do some simple things, right? You can't do things like find me all documents where A equals B. Seems sort of obvious as a thing you might want in a database, but Mongo doesn't support it, never has, but it should. Uh, same with the next one, right? Find me all documents where A equals the sum of B plus C. Doesn't exist today. So uh, these two examples are relatively sort of simple, but the real question long term is, well, what are, what is the scope of the query language, right? What is the right way to query a document database? Part of the problem is along, long, you know, the way people store things in documents is a lot of rich hierarchy. So do you want to support things like nested? Do you want to support recursion? Do you want to support all these sorts of more advanced things, right? You've got a little bit of something analogous in XPath, and an XML document is somewhat similar to a JSON document. How many people here love XPath? One person, two, or three people. So XPath actually has some good things, but it's not perfect. And I think we want to see if we can try to, you know, take that and make it really fit well for a document model. And so there's still a lot of work to do around there. You know, we spend a lot of time talking to people in the community. We spend a lot of time talking to people who are using the product, trying to figure out what they want to do. You know, so one of the interesting things that we did early on was we added an escape patch for the query language. We added a feature where you could actually run JavaScript in the server and say, fine, you know, run this JavaScript expression against the document to match it, right? And the, great, the reason why we did that was like, we knew the query language wasn't finished yet. So we're like, oh look, we're gonna move this little back door. And if you need to do a query and you can't express it, just use this back door. But the truth of the matter is we don't want people to use that. It's sort of the wrong way to think about this thing. We have to sort of figure out the right ways to innovate on the query language, add all the features we care about, make it fully expressive, make all these things work, right? So query language, you know, very important. It's sort of, you know, Obviously, it's a database, querying is sort of the most important thing you do. And one of the things we care a lot about with MongoDB is that it's a general purpose database and not something very specific. Right? It's not a key value store. It's not something where you just do like gets and puts. You actually can run queries and do complex queries and do 
sorts and you want to do index intersections and combine text search and aggregation and all sorts of crazy things. So these things sort of have to work. So the next thing we'll talk about is updates. Right, so okay, now I've got data in my database and I want to update it, right? Same kind of problem we had before, right? So I want to be able to do sort of more complicated things in the update universe, right? I want to be able to do a query that says update all documents and set A to the sum of B plus C. Again, it seems fairly straightforward, but all the same problems apply. How do you handle recursion? How do you handle match all documents that have this sort of attribute in this, doc, in this array and then update all the things beneath this array that happen to match this other attribute? You can sort of imagine it can, this massively complex language for describing how you update a document. Right? And one of the key things we care about in MongoDB is that you, can't, you don't just replace a document when you, when you want to modify it. We care a lot about you modifying a small piece of it. And there's some very good reasons for that, right? So one of the things you don't have in MongoDB, today at least, and we'll talk more about this later, is multi-document transactions. So a typical problem in MongoDB, you are storing a, um, a item that you have on a shelf that you're selling, right? And you want to keep track of two different things, how many you have in stock and who's bought it, okay? Fairly straightforward. If you were going to store this in a relational database, you'd have two tables. One is a item underscore SKU table that would have you know, the item ID and how many you have in stock. And then another table with an item ID and who's purchased it, okay? If you want to go and sell one of these things, you make a transaction. The transaction decrements the counter in one table and inserts it onto the other table. It's a transaction, it's all atomic, it's all clean, very nice. In Mongo, you can do something similar but very different at the same time. So in Mongo, you would do is you have a single document. The document has a number in stock attribute and an array, an embedded array of who's bought it. And so you do a single update statement that says, decrement this counter and add something to this array, which in Mongo is a dollar sign, a dollar push. So decrement this counter, push up, push onto this array. So now you're doing the same thing, right? You do this one update statement, you're making, you're modifying these two fields. That happens in a transaction in isolation, it's all clean. So you can do things like only do this if you have more than one in stock, so you don't you know, oversell or anything. And it works pretty well. Right, you can't do that if you're trying to replace the entire document. Right? You've got to make these sort of very minor modifications to a document with very specific modifications, which means the update language has to be incredibly expressive. Today, it's, you know, it's pretty good. Lots of people are using it. But I think it's sort of still a long way to go on making sure you can do anything you want. Right? I'm not sure if it's going to be as full-fledged as like, you know, a programming language, but you sort of want to get pretty far along the way. And if you look at sort of the feature requests on Mongo and you look at the, some of the top rank feature requests about Mongo, a lot of them have to do with updates. Right? A lot of them have to do with how you can modify data, largely because that's the way we tell people to model data. I right? put a lot of data into a document and then sort of modify small pieces of it in these transactions. So um, next is sort of similar, and don't have, some of these things are hard to put on slides, and we'll just talk about them. So the next thing is aggregation. Right? Aggregation is very important in the database. And when we talk about aggregation, I think there's two sort of worlds for aggregation. One is real time and one is batch. So with Mongo, we care a lot about real time, not, a lot of, not as much about batch. Right? Batch processing is you take all your data, you, you know, put it into a warehouse, and then once a day you want to run this query that takes an hour on it and do tons of data processing and intelligence on it and those sorts of things. Mongo can, has, can do that. It has some facilities for doing that. It's not, what it's, you know, it's not what it's designed for. There's lots of things designed for that. There's data warehouses, there's column stores, there's a dupe. There's lots of things that you can do with that. We do care a lot about real-time analytics. Right? Real-time analytics, things like scoreboards on websites. Right? You've, got your, you've got some sort of score information going to the database, and I want to be able to do scores on that in real time. I want to be able to do quick aggregations. I want to do faceted navigation. Right? I want to be able to put a complex query into the database and then do facets on it and compute you know, groups and figure out how many things are going to come back from different you know, if I do different filters. So lots of sort of real-time aggregation. That we care a lot about, right? So the initial versions of Mongo had really no facility for this except for MapReduce, which is a little heavyweight and a little slow for real-time. So uh, 18 months ago, maybe two years, actually two years ago, so time, yeah. We added this thing called the aggregation framework, which lets you do some simple aggregations. So it was pretty good, people like it, but it's still, again, very early. So some of the things we need to do there. One is we need to sort of reinvent the way it interacts with the rest of the system. 
Right, we sort of did this again as sort of an experiment. Do people want this? Do people like it? Is it the right model? People like it, but they want to go through a lot more powerful things. They want to be able to take a text search, combine that with a geo search, and then do, then do some faceted navigation on top of that. Right? Find me all Starbucks within five miles of my current location grouped by color. That's a bad example. Um, find me all restaurants within five miles of me grouped by cuisine or something. Right, simple stuff, but this way you can combine multiple features of the product, you can use a geo search, you can use text search, you can find all restaurants that happen to have hummus on the menu, and you can do all sorts of fun stuff like that. And you know, you can't really combine all these things in a nice, clean, concise way. You want to be able to do it with pretty large result sets and do sort of arbitrary, you know, completely arbitrary sorts of things. Um, and the other cool thing about the same aggregation system is it can actually let you do all sorts of other things like, oh wait a minute, if I've got an aggregation pipeline, sort of what it's called, and this pipeline does some things. So maybe it does a filter, and then it sort of reformats the data, and maybe expands an array, and does some other sorts of aggregations. Well, why can't I go ahead and save that as a view? Okay, so now I define a view as a prefix on an aggregation pipeline. Call that a virtual database, or virtual collection. Now I can go query that virtual collection, and now I've got some DBA or someone who's configured this thing to, to do something. Oh, well, that's kind of cool. And now I can actually put permissions on that. And now when I do a query against that, I can sort of add more things, more, add more stages to this pipeline. And then I can, in the back end, go and optimize all of them together. And you can actually get some very powerful systems out of this. You get a lot of benefits. You get a lot of security benefits, a lot of query performance benefits, a lot of really, really nice things. So there's a ton of stuff we can do with the aggregation pipeline that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, I think it's pretty exciting, so I'm Hopefully we actually get to a lot of the cool stuff we're talking about. So the next thing we should talk about is interesting because it's a feature that people generally would never think something like MongoDB would ever have. Actually, the next two are sort of in the same. So the, the next one is uh, schema validation, right? So MongoDB, oh, what is MongoDB? Oh, it's a schemaless document database. You just shove data in and you get something back out. No validation, no correctness, no, I don't know what's going on. But that's sort of, not really a design goal or anything. It's just sort of, oh, it's JSON, so it's sort of the obvious thing to do. But there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to set a, some sort of um, validation hook onto a collection, right? So let's say you've got a collection that is full of people. You want to say something that, you want to say that every document that has to go into this collection has to have an email address field. That email address field has to be a string, that string has to contain an at sign, and the string has to be more than three characters, okay? I, I want everything in this thing to have an age, I want the age to be a number, I want it to be between zero and 120. Any other field you want to have in this document, fine, go right ahead. But it has to have these sort of common attributes, right? And this is pretty common, because a lot of people want to store some different types of data in the database. Right, so a common one is media, right? I want to be able to store images and PDFs and movies in the same collection, but they have different attributes. But they all have a few common ones, right? They all have names, they all have tags, they all have who uploaded it and a date and some sort of timestamp. So you know, there's a lot of work you want to do around there to make sure to really understand how do you make the database a little bit easier for people to, who have never been to this database before, when they go look at it, they can find something. Or if you've got a DBA who sort of only comes in when something goes wrong, so at least they have some ideas, you know, something they can look at. Another common use case for Mongo is an, a data aggregator. Right, so data aggregation is complicated because if you've, like, you've got 80 different databases coming into the same thing, you want to make sure there's at least some way to group the data together. Right, so maybe you want to have a phone number or an email address that has to be consistent across all of your data sources. But everything else can be sort of arbitrary, you sort of shove it all in there. But you still often want something that is common. Right, something, some fields that sort of make sense to the other. So that all sort of makes sense. So the last thing we'll talk about on the innovation side is again another feature that people wouldn't expect Mongo to have, which is sort of multi-document transactions. And we sort of talked about before that we don't have them, but the truth of the matter is maybe, maybe we should have them. So the first question is why don't we have them? Anyone know? So the reason why we don't have them is that one of our main tenets is we don't want to add any features, and we've screwed this up a couple of times, that you can't scale horizontally, right? So if you add a feature, it has to be scale horizontally so that you, know, you don't get into the situation where you rely on the feature, and then you want to scale horizontally, and you're like, oh, sorry. <coughs> 
So, okay, so multi-document transactions and a horizontally scaled system are problematic because they require a two-phase commit or some other locking mechanism. Those locking mechanisms tend to scale horizontally very poorly. The systems that do that tend to use sort of very high-speed interconnects and doesn't really scale horizontally. Maybe in, inside of a rack it does, but a lot of the Mongo deployments are not just like in a rack, but they're you know wide. They're, they're very wide, right? They're across the entire globe. You've got you know primary data centers in five different, you know, four different continents, and that's important to you. So you can't really do that kind of model in a Mongo DB deployment. So how can you solve this problem? Well, one thing we want to do is let you define multiple collections that you shard on the same key. So let's say that you have a user collection and a user accounts collection, right? And you want to transfer money from one of your accounts to another account. And you want to you know, modify your user document at the same time. So three different documents involved, two different collections. What you should be able to do is tell the database, hey, these two collections are sharded in the same field. Make sure that the chunks of the data for, you know, for the same key is on the same server. And the system can do that because it's all based on the key. So once you do that, now I know for sure that any transaction involving a single key or a single user is happening on a single server. Once you do that, then sure, go right ahead and have multiple document transactions. Right, so this is not completely general purpose. Right? If you've got, you can't transfer money from one person to another in this model, but I can transfer money from one account of mine to another account of mine. I can, if I've got a blog system that I'm modeling in MongoDB, I can make sure that all the comments to the same blog live on the same server. So then I can do things like you know, multi-document transactions across multiple comments on the same blog. So it solves a lot of use cases, not everything, but it solves a lot of the problems where people do need multi-document transactions and still lets you scale horizontally. So this is a feature you know, we don't have today. Again, something we want to add. Still need to figure out exactly how it works. There's a lot of little edge cases and a lot of little things that make work well. But for a lot of people, it would make a pretty big difference. So the question is, you know, what if you virtualize servers? The key is that you know, once you have the same shard key, it lives on the same Mongo process, right? Everything with the same key would have to live on the same Mongo process. So it doesn't matter if it runs on virtual hardware or real hardware, if you move it or not, it's all in the same place. And once it's all in the same place, you can do those transactions. And so again, it's not a completely generic transaction system, but it actually gets you a large, a large portion of the way there. And then you can at least start modeling another kind of problem in the system. So it's just sort of another way that we're sort of trying to innovate around the query lanes and on document databases and sort of how all these things work together. Any questions on any of these pieces? You, you sort of waved, waved off quickly when you were talking about the aggregation framework mm -hmm. that, well, this might seem like something that we would handle by MapReduce, but that was sort of batching we weren't going to do it. it. Maybe I got that wrong. That, but it sounded like the aggregation features were something that could be done with MapReduce. So, and, and so my, yeah. my, just, my question is, as an innovator, how do you think about, well, I'm going to talk about this in terms of a new feature set, something I call an aggregation framework, instead of talking about it as enhancing my MapReduce capabilities. Or yeah, so the question is sort of, we had this MapReduce thing, and MapReduce is a superset of the aggregation framework. There's nothing you can do in the aggregation framework that you can't do in MapReduce. Right. So we're actually pushing a feature that is a subset of the old feature. So the sort of question is sort of, I guess, why? So there's a few reasons. One is MapReduce is JavaScript based. And we'll get to the technical reasons and then we can get to the other stuff too, right? JavaScript based means, so what, that, what does that mean? Well that means that in your program, or in your Python code or Java code, you're actually writing JavaScript and sending that JavaScript to the database. Right? One of the things people like about Mongo is that you're not writing a language inside of a language. Right? When you're writing SQL, you're actually doing a string concatenation or other sorts of magic inside of your code to generate code to send to the database. And JavaScript suffers from a lot of the same pro problems as that, right? JavaScript-based and MapReduce. It's hard to debug, it's hard to understand, it's not declarative. So that, that's a problem. Two, MapReduce is actually not that simple, right? It's very, the, the basic concept is simple. Once you understand it, you can sort of model lots of problems using MapReduce framework, but it's not sort of the intuitive way to think about things, right? If you just want to say, hey, you know, 
query this table, group things by the state, and do a count. Right? If you, so like, um, if in SQL, you know, something like select state comma count star from users group by state. Oh, I can sort of get that. Right? It makes sense. It's pretty easy. Doing that in MapReduce, it's two JavaScript functions, and you know, it's sort of like wonky and weird. So one is we want to make it a lot simpler. We want to make the language a lot more declarative, a lot cleaner, a lot more ability to chain things together. So you can sort of, it's a lot more like Unix pipelines, where you can sort of like do one thing, then do another thing, then do another thing, and sort of keep adding pipelines together. So it's just sort of these pipeline stages, and you add one to the next, and the next, and the next. We want to make it simpler, so it's easier to debug, easier to understand. Right, you can just do the first part and the second part, and you, at each stage you can see the output. So it's very easy to debug, very easy to reason about. Also, because it's not just sort of this generic JavaScript framework, we can actually op optimize it way better. So it can be, you know, orders of magnitude faster, which makes a big difference. And so overall, you know, yes, you lose some features, but for the actual users who are using it, it's a much more useful. <coughs> and so, you know, I, I think you know, the raw power sometimes is not nearly as important as the ability to use that power. And this is a case where the you know the full-fledged JavaScript mapper just didn't make a lot of sense, right? Even if you look at the Hadoop e ecosystem. Right, most people these days are not writing Java MapReduce classes. Right, they're using Hive or Pay or some other query language for Hadoop because no one wants to write Java programs to query their database. <coughs> Same reason, no one wants to write JavaScript functions to query their Mongo database. Right, you just want to be able to type a declarative query into a program or into a shell and have it. Work. So that's sort of where we were going with that. Is there a question in the back? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, is there a chance that some of the result from Uh, the question is, can the result of an aggregation be fed into queries? Well, you can put a filter on the back part of an aggregation, right? So you can always do, right, the thing with the aggregation pipeline is you can always chain anything together, right? So you can do a query, then a group, then a filter, then another group, then another filter. You can sort of chaining these attributes one after the other, after the other, after the other, as many as you want. So you can sort of, it's pretty arbitrary. It's very much like Unix pipes, where you sort of like pipe the output of one thing to the other thing to the other thing, and you just keep going. So, um, moving on. So maturity is an interesting thing, especially in the context of a database. Right, so if you look at something like Oracle, or let's start with, we'll start with MySQL. Right, so MySQL, Monty, start, you know, Monty started working on MySQL in his spare time in the 80s. Right? And my history may be a little fuzzy here, but. So he started working on himself in the 80s. I think he started hiring people around 93. <coughs> I remember I first tried it in 2000, it was, no one really used it at that point. By 2003, 2004, it was like, okay, this is a real database. Or this is something that people would actually use for real. So if you look at the amount of time that elapsed between those, those milestones, you're talking about at least a decade. So one of the things that's both really exciting about MongoDB and really scary about MongoDB is the first line of code was written just about six years ago. Literally, like a single line of code six years ago, no previous code, it's all from scratch. There's nothing, not based on anything else. So it's a very new database. Uh, just in the scheme of things, right? And the adoption we've had in those six years is you know, tremendous. What we have today is basically a, a database that, you know, we have almost all the subsystems we need. Right? We're not like adding new subsystems. Like early on, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have journaling in like the version 0 0.1.0. We didn't have sharding in version until 1.6, you know, we're at 2.4. But, you know, so we didn't, you know, but at this point, we actually have all the major components. So now what we're doing is actually taking each component and re reinventing it, rebuilding it from scratch. Right? So right now we're building, we're rebuilding the update system. We're doing updates like we talked about before. We're, re we're completely rewriting the query system. We're going to be doing other, you know, every system we're looking at. And there's a few reasons why we're doing this. Uh, one is sort of obvious that we need to make them better. Right? Every subsystem should be better. All these subsystems are relatively new. And each one of them, we've, we have, you know, we've learned a lot about them in the last three years, and about how people use Mongo, and how people want to use a document database, and what the requirements are, and what the scalability requirements are, what the features are, all those sorts of things. So we need to sort of keep reinventing those things. And the other really interesting thing about maturity, about the sort of about maintainability of a code base is, I have a pretty firm belief that any code base that isn't rewritten every three to five years rots. Right, so it's kind of a funny thing to say, right? Why does code rot? It just sort of sits there, it doesn't change itself. And the answer tends to be, you, know, you write some code, you think it's pretty good. Maybe it's a B plus, A minus, pretty solid piece of code. It's a good subsystem. 
So what's the thing that happens two months later? Someone wants to add a small feature. Okay, great. You add a little small feature, you add a little tiny little wrinkle on the surface because it didn't quite you know, it, it didn't quite work for that thing. Okay. Five years later, you've added 47 features to this thing. And now it completely doesn't work anymore. It's like completely unreadable. And this is sort of the standard way code gets written. And unless you go ahead and take all you know the original code plus those 40 things and completely rewrite the whole thing, you're left with something that's completely unmaintainable. And so I you know I think we're sort of at that stage where we're taking each of the subsystems, starting from the, some of the earlier ones, and just rewriting all of them so that you know it's actually maintainable, we can add features. And you want to be able to add features quickly, right? You know, every time you know, the 40th feature you, you know, add on to a code base is a lot harder than the first one. So starting from scratch again really helps a lot where you can actually say, all right, here's all the things we need to do with this code base. How do we design it in such a way that it all works really cleanly and that it comes out really, really nice so that when I add features, Maybe the next time around, I sort of have a little bit better idea of what kinds of things I may have to add, so I don't have to keep making my code worse. Just wanted to ask if you could just take a little step back and describe. I'm familiar with your reputation, but not everything around your product. Um, and I just wanted to know if you could take a step back and talk about how how your uh, product came to evolve. What, was the, what were the voids in the marketplace, how it came to evolve, what problems you're solving today, and a little bit more about the customer applications um, and why what you do, the database, is so much more powerful or easier to use. Is that the story that I hear? And if you could just take a little bit back. Yep. All right, we'll come back. We'll come to that. In. Okay. We'll, we'll come back around in a minute. So, you know, the truth of the matter is you know, the database is very new, and so we're sort of constantly reinventing it, and we're sort of reinventing it from the you know, bottom up right now, and I sort of hope to keep doing this every three to five years, because I think if you don't do it, you sort of get stuck into it. All right, so we'll take a quick detour, and uh, you guys can sort of say, you know, nod if you want me to keep going, or shake your head if you get bored of this topic. But a little bit of history of sort of what Mongo's good at and why it's, why it's interesting. Maybe you'll agree, maybe you'll disagree. So the key for us when we were building, when we started building Mongo, right, there's really three different things we cared a lot about. One is, one is horizontal scalability, right? Vertical scalability stopped working at some point. You, you know, getting bigger boxes, you can, but it's, it's a lot harder now because they just don't exist as much. You can't get faster CPUs. You can't, you know, you can get a lot of RAM, but it doesn't quite work as much. And the cloud doesn't work at all. If you want to be an EC2 and you are at their biggest box size and you need to go bigger, you just can't get a bigger box. Right? So horizontal really is sort of the way to scale these days. Two is um, the way people write and deploy code is completely different now than it used to be. So I remember back in the day at DoubleClick, we used to take the system down every Saturday morning, or at least the, the management side of it, and take it down for a few hours on Saturday morning to do database maintenance. Because you know, it was used by traffickers, and traffickers don't work on Saturday morning, so you can take the database down and do some database maintenance. Makes a lot of sense, right? Well, Facebook can't go down for three hours on Saturday morning. It just doesn't work that way. The internet doesn't work that way. People expect applications 24 seven. So things have to be more agile. You have to be able to do more, much more incremental changes to, to, to code, to systems, to those sorts of things. And last, but I think most importantly, is really the way developers interact with the database. So if you look at a relational database, right, it's really good at some things. It's designed for some things. If you are reading the original papers, they were pretty explicit about what they thought it was really good for. And they're generally pretty, actually pretty accurate. But as it was the, that, you know, the, only, the only database game in town, it sort of became used for everything. And what you saw is a massive evolution in not the database space, but the office relational mapper space. So, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of object relational mappers on the market today. Tons of them, they come out and every week there's a new one and some, you know, some new one somewhere. And the reason why they keep making new ones is not because the old ones are terrible, it's because the problem isn't solvable. Right? You're trying to take a problem that is mapping objects and classes and some programming language into a relational database, which is almost an impossible thing to do because they just don't mesh well together. And if you take that a step further, not only does that not mesh well together, it doesn't mesh well for people. Right? If you're trying to look at the database and you want to find that information about Elliot, 
do you want to go look at 100 different tables and you know, have get everything segmented out? Or do you want to look at a single document that is everything you know about Elliot? And also from a performance standpoint, do you want to do a, a join where you have to load a thousand different rows from 50 different tables, or do you just want to load a single document? And so these are sort of the problems that people have. And people solve them in different ways. Right? Facebook solves this by making everything a blob in MySQL and using it as a key value store, and not really using SQL. Other people solve it by scaling you know, your horizontal your database and doing all these, you know, doing a part my, my manual partitioning of MySQL and writing a bunch of fancy code on top of it to do things and not really using transactions or those sorts of things. So lots of ways people solve this. You know, if, if you know anyone uses ORMs, they all say, you know, at some point they leak and you can't do it. So the real problem is that you're trying to solve a problem that's impossible. And so what the document database does is, you know, the key is really the data model. Right? So now you've got a data model that actually maps the way people think about data. Right? If I want to store information about an order in a database, I've got a single document that is my entire order. Right? It's got the person, where it's shipped to, what they bought, how much it cost, what they paid the tax. I've got the whole thing mapped in a single document. So very easy for a human to understand. I don't have to do this complicated mapping in my code. In my code, I've got some map structures, some object that represents something. And I can pretty much store that as a one-for-one -one mapping directly into the database. So it's a complete paradigm shift for developers and for people, which is just a lot more intuitive for people. So people like it, they understand it, it's easy to work with, it's flexible, right? so you can add more attributes, you can sort of make it more complicated, you can do nested structures. So all those things sort of work. And the key is you can do those things, right? Now if you, you could say that, hey, I can just store a JSON blob on my SQL and then just fine. The key is that Mongo actually understands that JSON document and lets you do things with it. Right, it lets you index embedded fields, it lets you index arrays, so you can do sort of multi-key things, like you can have an array of states and index each element in there. You can update small pieces of it, so you're not just doing a full replacement of the full document, you can modify a single thing, you can add things to an array, you can increment a counter, you can add to a set, you know, you've got actually a lot of power in there. And so it actually becomes pretty usable. So that's really why people like it, and that's why I like it, I think that's why people like it. And so it's just a much easier way to think about things. And so what most people tell me is that you know, when they use Mongo, it's, they don't actually think about it too much. It's actually just very intuitive. They like it a lot. And it's only when they try to go back to a relational database do they realize how much they like Mongo. It's like, because it just sort of gets out of their way and lets them do what they want to do. And that's sort of the goal, right? You know, no one is ever going to say the database is what made them successful. Where the database is a tool that you use to get your job done and you know, lets you get on your way to actually do what you're trying to do. It's never going to make your business. It's just going to get out of your way. <coughs> And that's what people want with, you know, want with Mongo, and also people like it Mongo. It gets out of their way, and those are the focus on what they actually care about. I don't know. And in terms of use cases, I mean, it's sort of all over the map. People use it for everything from, um, you know, for everything, like entire websites, down to sort of things like user tracking, to CRM kind of stuff, to CMS, to video stores, to image stores, to data aggregation, I mean, sort of like everything. Uh, it's really a general purpose database, and when we try to verticalize concepts, it doesn't really work very well. I mean, you look at the customer and like all those things, it's really just across the entire universe of types of applications. You know, on the use cases, how do customers deal with <coughs> the embedded base being a relational database? I want to use MongoDB. How do they? How do they? Yeah, so the question is how does, it, how does a company who's got a large investment in relational database has moved to Mongo. And actually, there's a pretty clear pattern of how this happens. So someone starts, like, oh, I want to use Mongo. Oh, well, what do I do? Well, one is you find some new thing you need to build. It's sort of on the side. It's not mission critical. They put that in Mongo into production for a few months. They're like, oh, this is really cool. It works pretty well. All right, now I go take some other subsystem that I sort of want to rewrite, and I move that subsystem. And hopefully that goes really well. And then maybe they start moving a bigger subsystem, and then maybe they're paranoid, and so they start writing to Mongo and writing to the relational database at the same time. And they're going to reach from the relational databases and see if Mongo can keep up. Oh, great, it's keeping up. So let me move my reads over. And eventually they turn off their right to their old system. And you know, so generally it's very, it's very step by step. And it's, you know, it's very hard to take, you know, unless you're a small company, it's very hard to take an entire database and move it to Mongo sort of just wholesale, like in one day. And it's you know, a lot of work. You've got to, like, the code is, you've got to rewrite a lot of your code, you've got to change the way you think about things. And so it's generally the piecemeal. You know, if you asked us six years ago what our goals were, it was not that people were going to port all of their applications to Mongo, because that's a lot of work. But what we really care about is that when you're starting a new thing, or starting a new application, or a new subsystems, that Mongo is your, your, your choice. 
right? It's, porting is a lot of work. I think people are doing it a lot, but it, it is a fair amount of work to do. I, I would think you'd see plenty of people make mistakes and attempt to port their relational database applications by creating things that look like relational table structure, trying to create things that look like relational table yeah, structures in a Mongo thing. Yeah, a very common mistake is yeah. taking a one-to-one -one mapping from yeah. your tables in Oracle to your Mongo collections, and that just doesn't work. Right. right, you can't do the same kinds of things. It makes no sense. And if you do that, it will it will fail. I guarantee you yeah, yeah. the project will fail. Could you give an example of financial applications that use Mongo, and if you can give some numbers, like performance metrics, how much data you can grow. Um, PR people remind me what I'm allowed to say, not to say. So, um, so in financial terms, there's other terms, it's always, um, so MetLife is using Mongo for some pretty big stuff. They are aggregating 75, 72, one's here, 72 different data stores and pumping all the data to Mongo. The purpose there is a single database that they can query to get all of their stuff. Uh, I don't think they're public about their size. Um, other pieces, there's another company that is using it as a um, transaction processing system for like keeping a log of transactions. They're doing, um, you know, they've got on the order of a thousand machines doing on the order of many millions of bits per second. The five to ten millions of bits per second. So, so a lot, a, a lot of volume. Data sizes, you know. So a lot of data, a lot of throughput. Um, That's actually the company that I heard say that you did a really good job, by the way. Okay. So you're allowed to mention your name. I'm allowed to mention their name. That's good. Yeah. So then um, we've got, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs is doing something different in the finance industry. They're doing. They're actually building a Mongo platform as a service internally, because there's a lot of people who want to use it, and they want to build like a central place where they can sort of. They can manage it that way, so they're doing some interesting things there. So they can use it for lots of different applications, so all sorts of different things. All right, moving on. Um, so, so, so on the majority side, sort of lost track of where I am. But on the majority side, you know, so again, it, you know, it all comes down to making the database do what you expect a database to do. Right, so another facet of maturity in my mind is things like integration with enterprise environments. Security is, a, is an interesting place. Right? These are things that, they're not different. We're not innovating. They're not new kinds of features. We're not inventing technology. We're not inventing new concepts here. But we have to take concepts that people expect, either from legal requirements or internal requirements, and we have to build those on top of Mongo. And this is sort of a lot of work. Right? The finance industry is a great example of someone who needs a lot of this work. Finance, government, a lot of sort of big enterprises that require tons of things. They require auditing and integration with Kerberos and LDAP and tons of different subsystems. And so we're doing a ton of work on just making sure we have all those things people expect a database to have. Right? And it, it's sort of it's a good fact for Mongo because people are putting Mongo in places that a six-year-old database tends not to go. And so we're being asked to add all these features a lot earlier than we actually thought we were going to. And so we're doing a pretty good job keeping up, but there's a lot of work to do for us on just making sure we have all those things people want as our enterprise database. Any questions on uh, on this before we switch tax a little bit? I do have a question on the commitment to asset. So um, I'm going back to what you said. Um, so basically, you're saying you know it seems like your your rule of thumb is protect the scale out, right? So you want to make sure everything scales out. Yes. And I think the example you gave is something along the lines of partitioning. So partitioning user on a particular machine. Uh, sorry, say that again? Um, it seems like partitioning was what you were suggesting is the way to, to protect the scale out. So Mongo has a built-in feature for, it, it has a sharding feature built in, which does the partitioning automatically for you. I'm not sure I got the question. Um, well, it, it, goes, it goes back to acid, right? So if you want to make sure that, for instance, you want to subtract from one field and add to another, make sure it's one. I see. Atomic. So I'm, I'm wondering about the level of commitment to that because the NoSQL movement is moving away, you know, it's more away from acid, right? So that way it can scale and it's very, very easy. So, 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 so acid is real. So the, if, you, if you dissect acid, the, the key difference is really the level of time, the level of isolation and the level of atomicity, right? Mongo is durable. It has a it has a log, if it crashes, it plays the log, it's all sort of standard. 
Um, it's consistent. Mongo is actually fully consistent, right? You can it's fully serializable. So any you know, if you're you know your application is asynchronous, but the order of, the order of application is the same on any node, so you never get out of order writes or anything like that. So it's fully consistent. It's fully durable. So the question really comes down to isolation levels, and the key difference is that there are no transactions, right? So I'll come back to transactions. You can't do a isolated thing across multiple multiple things. Right. In a relational database, you can do a totally generic transaction that you can touch as many things as you want. And put that all into a transaction. It's all guaranteed to be isolated. It's all guaranteed to be atomic. In Mongo, it's only a single document, but it is asset at for a single document. Right. So if you do an update statement that modifies multiple fields in the same document, it is sort of it meets all sort of the asset requirements. It's just the level. It's just whether it's at the document level or a transaction. That's sort of the key difference. And when we, if we do add the multi-document transactions we talked about, then those will be fully asset. Right? It's just sort of what level you're talking about. Yeah. So my, I guess my question for this topic of maturity is that is that where you're heading towards? Is that where, like the future of, of, of your uh, system? Well, I think multi-document transactions. You know, I think those will, will add those. I don't think we're ever you know going back to what I said before. So I don't think we'll ever add completely generic transaction support because. That breaks scalability, <coughs> but everything short, anything, everything short of breaking scalability. I mean, yeah, I mean, Mongo's always, you know, assets, you know, durability, and all those things are always really very important. And I think asset actually, in some ways, is a little. It needs to be updated a little bit, right? So one of the things about durability that's interesting to me is that relational databases were designed very much with durability meant writing to local disk, um, which is a good thing, especially thirty years ago. That was the way to do it. And we think about durability as yeah, writing to local disk is good. But we're taking it in a slightly different direction, right? So what do we really care about? Well, especially if you're on EC2, you're in sort of all these different environments. I really care about being in multiple data centers, right? I want to be not. I want to make sure that this write is not just in, on a disk in some data center that I don't know where it is. But I don't want to tell the user that they changed their password until it's in two different data centers that are at least 100 miles apart from each other, right? So I think the whole way you think about asset and durability needs to change a little bit, right? I think a lot of it's a little bit antiquated. And you need to you need to update things a little bit, right? A lot of our users don't care about any data center. They don't trust any data center. They're on EC2. They expect an EC2 data center to go away and, and sort of willy nilly, just you know, totally arbitrary. And so it's very important that we update the, you know, what does it mean for a write to be durable? That, what does that definition mean? What configurations do you have? Right. So in Mongo, you can do things like configure on a per write basis what it means to be committed. Right. So you can say, all right, don't. Don't tell me that this is done until it's in memory. Don't tell me it's done until it's on local disk. Don't tell me it's done until it's on two servers, or on the majority of servers, or on two data centers, or three data centers, two different racks. You sort of configure what durability means to you. So I think, I think we're going to go that way and sort of expanding the definition a little bit to so sort of modernize it a little bit. Any other questions on? Uh, it seems you're competing with Cassandra. Uh, in somewhat, not not often directly, actually. Could you talk just a little bit about what, where you would or where you wouldn't? Because it seems, and whether there's an advantage or disadvantage to competing against an Apache uh, open source product. Uh, so the question was like, you know, do we compete with Cassandra, and if so, how? And what about versus an Apache product? So uh, Cassandra is very different. Right? For those who don't know, it's a distributed key value store. And it's eventually consistent. So Cassandra is good for a few things, right? So it's good if you need a, like 100% write availability. It's good because you can do local writes that are eventually consistent, and that's sort of like you know that's one of the main reasons why you would use it. Um, I, I didn't talk about this one, but I think actually multi-master collection is something with Mongo that you could add. And so I think uh, Cassandra sort of you know was designed by Facebook, who actually don't use it anymore as far as I know, to solve a to solve a service problem, right? I've got this application that needs this service. Uh, and I think Mongo is a little different. Right? Mongo is really meant as a, I'm going to use Mongo as my main database, not as a key value store. It's a little, a little different proposition. Um, a lot of people use Cassandra very successfully, but I think we're going after a little different kind of a, kind of a thing. And uh, whether you're competing against an Apache product, I mean, we are open source. It doesn't, I, it doesn't, I, I have never seen us being Apache or non Apache as something that's ever come up or been an issue or anything. I think not being open source would be a huge problem for us. But I think if, I think a closed source database today would have a huge time getting any market share. 
So, sorry. So moving on a little bit, um, talking about management a little bit. So you know, as Mongo's grown, right? You know, as I said before, we've got you know, 330 some odd people, and 100 and, or 200 tech people, and 100 plus engineers. Uh, the management challenges are, are tough, and I don't think engineering management is a completely solved problem. I think managing engineers is consistently challenging. Today, not an exception in the least for me. And so it's a tough problem. And so one of the things I thought would be interesting to talk at least for a few minutes about you know, some of the things that I'm working on there and thinking about there. So um, one thing I talked about is, is coding. Right? So how many people here are sort of CTOs, GPs of engineering, or other sorts of engineering leaders? Most? Some? No? OK, a few. How many of you code on a daily basis? So a lot of you, that's good. So I actually firmly believe that anyone in sort of any engineering management machine has to, has to code to be relevant. And I personally don't know any way that I can actually tell people what to do in the code if I don't actually code myself. Um, I code mostly in one project on the core server, and I find on other projects it's tough, at least I'm coding a lot. I'm trying to code as much as I possibly can. And I really try to convince every manager that reports to me and every manager that reports to them to spend at least 30% of their time coding. And you know, the answer to it is, well, I don't have time to code. Is, well, you know, if you're a really awesome manager, you've basically made yourself irrelevant. And maybe you need to come in and like, you know, fix a few things here and there, do some one on ones But if you're an awesome manager, you're mostly irrelevant. And so unless you're a bad manager, you've got plenty of time to code. And that's sort of my philosophy. And I'm a mediocre manager, so I have a little bit of time to code. But I use it as much as I possibly can. And I sacrifice sleep and other such things so I can code as much as possible. But I think that's pretty important. And there's a few other things that I think are important. And one is sort of the management style. And so I'm sort of thinking about this a lot. I may write a blog post on it, but thinking a lot about what types of managers there are. And I've sort of been diagnosing myself as a manager and finding traits. And then I see these traits in other people. And I think there's three traits that I think are interesting that I'll sort of talk a little bit about. Um, well, first, there's this entertaining quote that's always entertaining. So I don't know how many people will agree or disagree with this sentiment. Um, certainly, yeah, I often agree with it. Moving on. So, oh, talk about this first. So, the first thing that a lot of people do, and I'm guilty of it also, is sort of the hyper owner manager. And I'm sure everyone here has worked with someone like this before. The person who sort of micromanages every task to, you know, forever and can't actually let anyone else take any control. You know, sort of happens a lot. They sort of run meetings more like a dictatorship. They don't let anyone else do anything creative. And if they're amazing, they actually can do a pretty good job. Can someone let them do the sad. Um, and so in some cases, they actually work pretty well. You know, you can imagine someone being, you know, if someone's an unbelievable manager and they know everything and they're on top of every single thing, then my command for me isn't so bad. But the first time they're sort of out of capacity, and the first time that they can't man actually manage a product to completion you've basically left a culture that has no creativity and no ability to manage itself. So in your absence, the team is almost useless. And so you know, I think a lot of people have this tendency. I definitely have this tendency at, at some times. And so something that I fight pretty often. So the next one is sort of the best friend. This is a little less often for me, but I see it happening once in a while. Right? Someone has had this problem before. Right, the person who is sort of wants to be friends with everyone that they're managing rather than actually managing people. And you know, it happens a lot where you know you don't actually end up managing anyone, you just sort of get their friends and you sort of try to make them feel good and try to make them happy. And actually someone I had a conversation today with someone, and you know, one of the goals of a manager is not to make everyone on their team happy. Right? It's not to make them like go home and be like, oh, I had a good day and smiling. Right? It's to make them proud of what they did that day. It's to make them proud of the product they're building. Right? And if you're the best friend, not, you're very often not going to be proud of what you did. You're going to be happy at the end of the day. You're going to feel like you had a fun day. You're going to, you know, weren't stressed, but you may not actually be proud of anything you've accomplished because you're going to actually accomplish anything. How old are your children? My children? <laughs> no. Uh, You'll see this one in parenting. Yeah. Well, I have little children. Yeah. They're small. They, uh, yeah, it comes up a lot in those conversations also. Especially the four and a half year old. Uh, and the third one is the true Democrat. This is one that actually sometimes drives me crazy. It's the person who really cares about fairness, and really wants everyone to have their say, and then nothing actually gets done. 
right? It's very different from the best friend because you know they're not motivated by like oh I want to be your friend. They're motivated by yeah it's a democracy. Everyone should get a vote. And then if there's like a tie, it's like nothing ever actually gets done, right? And I do think it's actually critically important that managers actually take a stand and you know let people discuss. But like you can't discuss ad infinitum. You've got to say all right, you know what? After 30 minutes, nominate someone to make a decision or just make the decision yourself and move on. I think you know sort of not making decisions is sort of one of the key things that people make mistakes with. And, uh, and um, yeah, you can't do that. What, what were some of the positives you brought over from, from the whole thing, and, and what are some of the negatives that you might decide as far as management goes? So, uh, positive and negatives with double click. It's been a long time. So, um, I mean, some of the positives. How many, how many people here worked with double click? One. No, you. Um, so, you know, DoubleClick had a very, it was definitely a, a very serious culture. It was not flighty. You know, if you think about culturally here, right, we're a database company. We want things to be, you know, fun and exciting, but it has to be a little bit more serious. Or it has to be a little bit more like, all right, a little bit more rigorous. Right, code reviews are not treated as sort of this fun thing you do on the side. Code reviews, you know, like, as a way to share what you've worked on. Code reviews are like a, no, we're going to, Beat this code until it's ready, until it's like really clean and good, and everyone understands it. So, I think DoubleClick was a little bit similar in that way, right? It was not a flighty company. Things were things were quite rigorous. Um, I think DoubleClick definitely suffered from a little bit of a democracy sy syndrome at some points. There was a lot of cooks in the kitchen in some projects, and nothing you, know, you couldn't drive anything to completion. Which is one thing I think, you know, sort of the democracy, the, the democrat, and the hyper owner sometimes, you know. You gotta be somewhere in the middle, right? You gotta like both drive things to completion, but at the same time let other people get involved too. Any extreme there is bad, but you sort of gotta balance it a little bit. Uh, I mean, double click did a lot of good things, but I think you know the biggest problem there was if I was gonna pick one of these things, it would be more on the democracy problem, a little too much management by committee. So, um, and last but not least, you know one of the things that I care a lot about with MongoDB in general is the community, right? If you look at where, how we decide what to build, a lot of it comes from votes and people asking questions and asking us for features and clients asking for features. And we really try to tackle what people care about you know, rather than what we think they might want. You know, one of the things that's interesting about management in a tech company is how information flows from clients back up to engineers. And so one of the things that I do, and some engineers like it, some don't, there's a few here who may shoot me or not, is uh, do support. Right. Every engineer who works on the logo has to do support. And the reason is very simple, is that if you don't understand what customers want or what they're doing, how are you ever going to build the right thing? You know, if a customer tells something to their field rep, and their field rep tells something to some product manager, and that product manager tells it to their, their boss, and then it goes to an architect, who goes down to an engineering manager, who goes down to an engineer, you've got this massive game of telephone, and we end up with something, some product that you never want. And I'm sure everyone here has worked with some technology product that feels like that. Right, it feels like, hey, this sort of almost does what I want, but they kind of miss the point. And I think that's what I care a lot about avoiding. I never want to build a feature that misses the point. Right? I want to take actual real world problems and solve actual problems by building the right thing, by listening to people, by actually listening to customers and listening to users and figuring out what they actually care about. So in my mind, you know, for a tech company, that's you've got to do that. It's sort of the only way you can build the right thing. And a lot of these sort of just kind of Guaranteed to make a ton of mistakes. So um, my blog, I'm pushing my blog because I just started it. It has some of the stuff on there. You should go read it. Any questions? Anyone else want to talk about? On your management uh, talk now, you have a company that you have 330 people. Yeah, 330 people. Kind of come over. So you know, when it's a thousand people, mm -hmm. do you really think you're going to be able to continue some of these principles, like every engineer, the support? Yep, so the question is, you know, we're 100 people now, or 100 engineers, we're 400 engineers, can we keep up some of those principles? And I think, actually, the answer is yes. The hard part, I think actually the hard part of the scale of this thing is early. But it's really hard when you go from, you know, no mid, no, no middle tier managers, and I hate that term, but like no, you know, no mid managers. Like, once you have middle managers, we're not going to add, like, more kinds of managers in the future. We're going to add more middle managers, maybe another layer. But I think, you know, 
but it has to be diligent, of course. But I think we've actually, in, recently, actually we've gone through, I think, what I hope is the worst phase. You know, going from one level of management to two to three was, that's where a lot of these problems surfaced. And I'm hoping that the, th the third tier is still very small. And as that tier expands, I think, we will, I think we'll be able to maintain those. I certainly hope so. Um, the other thing, we do have a bunch of things that try to help that. One is, I use a lot of uh, product managers and program managers to help sort of keep a relatively flat structure. Right, we try to keep you know the things pretty flat, manage a little manage a fair number of people, and use a lot of sort of people to sort of help keep things organized. And it actually works, it's, it tends, for us it's been working really well. We are able to keep things flat, keep information flowing really well, keep information flowing between teams very well. Right? That's also something that you know definitely for a while broke down when we sort of started getting different teams. Right? Originally there, there weren't teams, there were just people. And then, you know, so a lot of those sorts of things help a lot too. But you know, doing support, you know, people thought when we were five people, they're like, oh yeah, we're 100 people, or it was a whole support team, it's like a 45 person support team now. I don't have to do support anymore. Well, they, they love that thing, or do you want to do support? Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's no reason to stop it. I think it's actually, it's very important. And my mind, at least. As, as, a, as, a, as an enterprise software uh, private company in New York, that's mm -hmm. kind of like an oxymoron. Uh, how, how, how have you found it in terms of talent acquisition on the engineering side? You know, it's not like you have Oracle and all these other companies who yeah. have to take off engineers here. So the question was being an enterprise tech company in New York, how's hiring? And so the good thing about being, as being the oxymoron company is that we are sort of the enterprise company in New York. Like if you want to work for an enterprise tech company in New York, you don't really have a lot of choices. So it's actually really good for us. Uh, we've actually had an incredibly good look in New York. Uh, we found it easier to hire in New York in many ways than in Silicon Valley. Because in Silicon Valley, you've got so many tech companies, and it tends to be sort of a free-for-all, sort of a feeding frenzy. And in New York, you've got sort of more well-defined things, and we sort of are a little bit of the outlier. So uh, it's actually very good for us. Now, if there's 20 of us, it might be harder. But right now, for us, it's, it's actually very good. Yeah. Um, in development, are you using mostly Agile? How Agile are you, and how and why did you sort of choose that level? <coughs> So are we agile? Um, so on some projects we are completely, right? So uh, MMS, right, our management solution, hosted on-prem, that is completely managed in an agile fashion right now. Pretty almost agile right out of the book. Uh, and I'm sure it's really not out of the book. But um, it feels, it, from what people tell me, it's kind of like that. It's actually working really well. And for the hosted version, we deploy every two weeks. You know, it's the hot deploys all the time, but like, you know, it's a two week sprint, so it's, it actually works quite well. Uh, very happy with the way it's going. On the server, the server is pretty interesting because we can't do server releases every two weeks. Right? No one would upgrade. I mean, it's hard enough to get people to upgrade once a year, because once an enterprise has something in production that's working well, they kind of just leave it there. Uh, so you know, we're in more of a six to 10 month release cycle there. We do internal, we have been doing like, sort of like four to six weeks breakdowns inside of those releases, but I think we actually are going to move a little bit more agile there. And maybe not two week sprints, but at least sort of more well defined, shorter sprints internally. It's a little hard to be sort of motivated and disciplined about it because they aren't public, but they really are purely internal because no one wants a database to get released every three weeks. So it's a little bit tricky, but I think we actually are moving a little bit more that way. Just you know, shorter, we'll try to be a little bit more well defined sprints, but it is, it is tricky on a product that you can't release that often. Uh, hosted products are just way easier for those than uh, you know, lots of products, great, you know, I'd rather deploy them as possible. Um, do you have any plans to partner with uh, Progress or uh, Faith Direct to be like a source for their ODBC DSMs? Thank you. Uh, do we have any plans to uh, partner with them? Uh, no, not that I know of at least. I mean, we have a lot of partners and a lot of people doing things with us. I don't know of them particularly. Uh, so I don't know anything more than that. Are you still a startup? And if yes, what are your plans in five years? Are we still a startup? I have no idea. <laughs> um, sometimes it feels like a startup, sometimes it doesn't feel like a startup. Right? We've got a much nicer office than when we were a startup. On the other hand, you know, we're still growing very rapidly. Right? There's still rapid growth. Things are still evolving very quickly. Things are changing a lot. So we're sort of in that gray area. Um, in five years, I think the key really for us is, you know, as I said earlier, the first four or five years were really all about do people want this thing? 
can we build it that people care about it? And now it's really all about just all these gaps in the product that you know cause problems or that make people you know to lack of features so you can't use it. And it's really all about closing all the holes so that if you, you know, so that your choice of whether to use something like Oracle or Mongo is all about the data model. The data model and sort of the core feature set, right? Is it scalable versus do you want you know the, the Oracle model? Do you want relational or do you want document? And it's really about closing all the gaps of that as you're just, that's what that's all that matters. To, to make sure that um, your customers use Mongo well, design good applications that leverage it appropriately and have a good experience. Do you do you want your own people, like a professional services group, to propel that knowledge and evangelize, or or, or do you see working more with uh, um, you know third party system integrator shops and, and uh, contractors? So who should be the best Mongo pro? You know. So, uh, so I think the answer is, is both, so and more, right? So we've put a lot of effort into. Uh, we've got a very, we've got a surprisingly large services team that is really just helping people. A very large support team that isn't only focused on paying clients, but we do a lot of community support, trying to answer all the questions on Stack Overflow and really get involved in what people are doing. We have a large education initiative. We've got a whole online education thing with tons of classes, sort of like Cloudera style, yeah. but it's all free. You can yeah. go online and just take the classes. Uh, so we really push education a lot. Because you know, the, the, the interesting thing about Mongo is that in some ways you, you, get, you get into it and it feels really natural and really easy, but there are, it's not like a, it isn't a toy, right? It is a, it is a real database. And there aren't books you can buy that tells you, you know, there are books, but there aren't like, you don't have like the equivalent of like third normal form. You don't, you don't have these sort of like, oh, here's the rules of how you design your, your schema. Right? It's still evolving. So education for us is incredibly important in how you educate people. Well, do we work with third, like, uh, integrators of those things, absolutely. We're, we're working with a whole number of them right now. We're trying, we're trying to work with more. We're working on programs to train them and certify them so they really know what they're doing and we can sort of leverage them to help people get in the community. But we really want really to get the knowledge out there as much as possible. <clears throat> and if you look at a lot of the reasons why model projects stay out, a lot of it's because of the, people just don't understand the right way to use it. We haven't educated people in the right way. Sometimes we're still learning the right way to do certain things. Do you, do you want? Do want to make money off providing professional services? <clears throat> uh, do we want to make money off providing professional services? I think we don't mind making money off there, but we don't want to, you know, our goal is not to be a services right. company. You know, we're, we're not, we don't want to be a consulting company. So we are very happy to, I mean, we give away education for free. We give away, you know, we do a lot of community support for free. Uh, we do consulting and we, you know, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not designed to be a, like, that's how we're going to make a lot of money. It's really the way that, like, we want to make sure people are successful and people are, Use the product currently, um, and so we'll, we'll partner with every. You know, you know, we want to. You know, the problem with partnering with people is really all about how do you train them and certify them. Because you want to, you want to be able to say, here's a list of 20 partners that we trust are going to go out and do the right thing. And so, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, you can do it, but it's hard to sort of scale that. And <clears throat> something we're working on, but definitely not solve at this point. Um, I, I know you're competing on functionality, um, but when you go into an account and Enterprise making decisions with Oracle and you guys. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a sense of what the economics are of the difference between um, whether your solution or theirs? Yep, so the question is economics, Oracle versus Mongo. Um, so the differences are, you know, definitely Mongo is actually cheaper. You know, we have some white papers on the actual differences. And if you're buying, you know, if you're, if you, you know, if you're buying your sort of enterprise subscription and things, you know, it's definitely a good bit cheaper. I don't know if it's an order of magnitude cheaper, but it, it's a good bit cheaper in a lot of cases. But um, you know, one of the things we strive a lot for is really, you know, how many people here use Oracle? How many people here love working with Oracle? We really want people to like working with us. We really want to be friendly. Um, and part of the reason, you know, and part of the thing there is we are open source. So let's say you do buy a subscription for us and you get support and you maybe use some of our enterprise bits. If we don't do a good job, and we you know, don't help you and we're not useful and we don't add value, then you're just going to drop down to the free version and not pay us any money. So, uh, which is actually a good model in my mind because it actually means we sort of have to do a good job. It pushes us to actually do the right thing, which means hopefully we'll actually be friendly and pleasant to work with rather than sort of not that. Um, so the economics tend to be, tend to be pretty good. Yeah, so and, and the key actually is less about the hardware costs and that cost. The thing that people tell us most about sort of the, the monetary side 
is that the productivity gains on the engineering side are what really matters, right? If, you know, yeah, great, right, maybe my cluster is you know, $1 million versus $2 million, but my $10 million engineering budget is 50% more productive. That's a lot of, that's a lot. That matters a lot, right? One of the, you know, a lot of our early clients were like, why are you, you know, why are you moving this enterprise from Oracle to Mongo? And it wasn't because of money, it was because they were 18 months behind on their future roadmap because Oracle, they couldn't evolve on Oracle fast enough. And they got to Mongo and there was a catch up on the roadmap, right? And that's what drives a lot of this. It's less about sort of like the economics, which are better, but more about being able to drive product faster and innovate faster. Yeah, you mentioned Oracle a few times. Who else do you see as Right, so the, so the question is sort of, what do we see as a competition? The comp and for us, it's sort of interesting, right? So if you look at enterprises, people are really decided between using Oracle or SQL Server or DB2 versus Mongo. Um, in the startup world, it's MySQL, Postgres versus Mongo. In a few cases, other NoSQL things versus Mongo, but those are probably the exception, not the rule. Um, and so what are we competing on? So one of it is obviously features. Sometimes it's, we a lot of those we lack features. Rarely is it that people want a document data model, or maybe they don't even come, you know, I don't even know what those cases may be. But it usually comes down to, you know, one is, do they trust us yet? You know, again, six-year-old database, some people just aren't gonna trust a six-year-old database no matter what you do, which is actually a totally reasonable sense in my mouth. Like, you know, if you want to wait 10 years old, it sort of makes sense, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, it really comes down to features in a lot of case, you know, performance, you know, they're gonna do some POC, and, See if it works. See if it works better. You know, just see which one works better. See which one is cheaper. Um, which one the developers like more. Right? Mongo tends to come in bottom up. Right? Developers tend to bring it in because they are more productive, and then they sort of force the higher ups to use it because they're like, I'm more productive. I'm using it, and then I guess we got to do some production somehow. Um, so it's very bottom up. Is that how you're selling? Too? Sorry. Is that also how you're selling? So selling. I mean, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to be the expert on how we sell. I try to write code more than I sell. But you know, I think we, we do a little bit of both, right? It kind of seems coming from the bottom. You know, what we see in a lot of like big companies, for example, is we'll find like 30 small projects using it, and then we're like, all right, well, it's 30 small projects, and like we want to help them all, but it's much easier if we find some aggregation point. So we can sort of you know have a few people to talk to rather than 30 different projects that don't really have a budget and it's sort of complicated. Um, so that, so selling is more in the middle, right? It tends not to be something, we, we don't go to like a CIO and say, hey, you should move your entire platform to Mongo. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna tell all my developers to use Mongo now. That's not the way it really happens. It's, it's really bottom up, and then in the middle, we sort of get involved and try to <coughs> aggregate things and really get involved so we can help and move things over. But is, is there a certain company size that you're targeting? Like, you know, whether it's large scale enterprises? Or you're targeting that we're selling to? Yeah, either, you know, the amount of data or the no, we target, I mean, we actually do very, we don't do much outbound, we sort of just, you know, people come to us and they are using it and, you know, ask for things and we help them. Um, but no, we have clients everywhere from, you know, this is a Goldman Sachs down to, you know, a tiny store you can imagine. Um, so it's, it's all of them now. All of them now. So, uh, you know, Oracle has uh, made some, I guess they're getting a lot of uh, questions on, Put out a, a discussion lately saying that their execution time, you know, versus uh, companies like yourself, uh, 50 to 100 times faster. Lines of codes are much less. Have you, have you addressed any of these you know, topics that they came up? Um, I haven't seen those papers, but I'd be very curious to see the results. <laughs> I mean, most people move to Mongo from Oracle because of exactly those problems. So, you know. Anyway, yeah, I don't, yeah. so one of the things people criticize me for is I don't publish benchmarks. I refuse to publish benchmarks. I don't believe in benchmarks. I believe in trying something and seeing what works for your use case, largely because benchmarks are, I can, I guarantee I can craft a benchmark to make any product look really good. Uh, if you understand the product well enough, unless it's terrible, I can guarantee I can make something that makes it look awesome. And so, uh, you know, there's probably some, I'm sure someone can make it some, you know, something that Oracle's 100 times better at the moment, I guarantee you. Know, so, I think the proof is that people are moving from Oracle to Mongo pretty quickly. Um, and they wouldn't be doing it if it was really slow. That would make a lot of sense to me. 
So you, your client base measures from, you said, the Goldman Sachs in the world went down to the small startup. You can imagine where, where in there is a place where Mongo doesn't work. Where would be a place that doesn't fit? Where, for, in a company size? Company vertical. Uh, in a vertical? Yeah. Um, I think it's less about a vertical and more about a, a kind of, you know, I think you've got to have a company that is sort of willing to invest the time in learning and sort of teaching their ops team and exploring something new, right? Some organizations just don't have them. If you don't have database trouble and you don't have, you know, you're not set up for those kinds of experiments, then it's probably not the right kind of model. In terms of use case, you know, some, you know, some use cases you, you, you require SQL, or if you've got to integrate with some tool that uses SQL, then you sure can't use model, which is the obvious case. Um, some use cases are sort of designed for relational databases, and accounting, right? Relational databases were designed for accounting. If you're going to build an accounting system, you should probably build it in Oracle. Um, and those are the most obvious ones. But overall, it was pretty general purpose. Um, anything with sort of structured data, hierarchical data, so that, you know, it's pretty general purpose. We have a couple more questions. So, uh, first of all, congratulations on building this new round of funding, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is, you know, you're, you're based here in the U.S., you have headquarters here in New York and in Southern Valley. So I'm assuming you're doing most of your development work here. At the same time, you're also present in, uh, in Europe, in Australia. So in those areas, are you more focused on sales and uh, the whole support thing? Or is there also some development going on there? Yep. So the question is around what we do in every office, basically. So most of our development is uh, in New York in this office, right? At least 85% is in New York. We have some in some Silicon Valley. We actually have some in Europe as well. But largely, our international offices are for uh, services and you know services and sales. So support, consulting, pre-sales, uh, and sales. That, that's largely you know. But some we have some developers in, in London, some in Spain, probably some in Dublin soon, uh, some in Silicon Valley. So we, we have some that are just really truly distributed. But the most of the international expansion is on the, is on the field side. The second question is then, so how are you looking at Europe? Do you think it's saturated now, or are you looking to invest some of those uh, money into expanding your, your market kind of penetration in the European market, or no, I, I, else? Europe is definitely, you know, I think we're lagging a little bit in Europe, and we started, you know, we're stronger in the US than we started, obviously in the US, but we're doing a lot of investment in Europe as well. A lot of investment in Europe, a lot of investment in, in Asia, a lot of investment in Australia, uh, all over. We're, we're pretty understaffed. Compared to our sort of you know, what people want, we're pretty understaffed everywhere. So we're hiring pretty well. Um, lots of different offices, you know, we have opening offices, a couple offices in Asia soon, and really spreading out pretty wide. But yeah, most of the development really happens in this office. Thank you. Uh, one more question? This might have been implied in everything you said, and uh, I'm not a software developer, so. to a little, a little bit more structured. So the default for Mongo is, is totally unstructured. Um, and on the ability to move quickly, right, that's sort of, I think, what I was talking more about. You know, you've got a, every, you know, the code rot issue. I think Oracle, uh, I'll speak ill, but I think they definitely suffer from a little bit of that. I mean, most, it's very hard. I, it, there's a few companies out there that I know that are very good about constantly rewriting every component of their stack, but they're, they're rare. Um, you know, Google is a good example of someone who, the people that know Google, they, they, they do rewrite, but well, I know they actually do rewrite all the components all the time and constantly trying to make things better because that's the only way to prevent things from getting worse over time. Uh, any, one more question? Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for uh, hanging out. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be around for a little bit if you guys want to chat.